Hi, everybody. Um, I am going live with Jackie Janelli, our fabulous nurse practitioner, and we're going live to tonight to discuss what we're calling sexual pain part two. Um, we did a whole live on vaginismus, and I think we're going to do that again soon. Um, but this one, this particular live is going to be. Um, about sort of what I call like the more compu more complicated, oh, there's Jackie, the more complicated sexual pain syndrome. Um, oh wait, Jackie, okay, here we go. Um, vulvodynia, vestibulodynia, vulva vestibulodynia. Um, and um, let's see, it should work. We practice, so Jackie should be here. It'll, it's always, you know, I always get excited. I always think like it's a miracle when, you know, the person shows up. Uh, Jackie, did you accept my invitation? Hello, Jackie. Jackie did not, let me try again. Hold on a second. Oh, wrong Jackie, that may be why. I invited the wrong Jackie, oh my God. Jackie, whoever you are, Jacqueline Finch, I apologize. I'm sure you did not want to be the, hi Jackie, I invited the wrong Jackie, some poor Jackie. Uh, again. <laughs> So poor I Jackie love... got an invitation for me. Oh my God, I apologize, other Jackie. And I um, would love to have you on as a guest sometime soon, but I just don't know if you feel comfortable talking about Bovidinia and Vestibulodinia. <laughs> Hi, Jackie. Hi. Hi, Bachelor. I know, it's so, like, I feel like I don't see you. I did see you last week, so that's good. Jack, that nice. This Jackie's in the office, but... Um, Half my face is showing, but so this is, you're seeing me real for real now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, no mask, so no like mask. no mask. So um, we're, be, we're gonna be talking about um, the, what I'm calling more complicated pain syndromes, yeah. um, vulvodynia, vestibulodynia. Um, but I do wanted to start because I asked people to give like, send in questions that they had. And a lot of the questions still felt like people were asking about tight muscles. And so before we do anything else, maybe you can just like, once, again, define for people the difference between what we think of as vaginismus and what we think of as these other ones. So let's just start with that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is an important distinction because they are two very separate conditions that are sort of um, also, you know, intertwined in the sense that one can cause the other and vice versa. So it is, and they all start with V. So it, it you know, for the lay person, it is hard to kind of wrap your head around what means what. But so again, vaginismus, we talked about this, I think it was, you know, three or four weeks ago now is, so it is tight muscles or spasm or involuntary contraction of the muscles in the, around the opening of the vagina that can prevent penetration. Um, that is a different condition than vulvodynia or vestibulodynia or vulvo vestibulodynia was basically basically all mean about the same thing, give or take some like slight distinctions, which we'll make today. Um, and what that is, is so anything that ends in dynia, when you're talking about medical language, refers to pain. So you can always kind of take that D-Y-N-I-A and say, okay, something that hurts. And then you can take the first part of the word and say vulvodynia. So your vulva is hurting. Your vulva is, for those who don't know, is, you know, combines the labia majora, the labia minora, the clitoris, the urethral opening called the meatus, it's, the it's what, you, it's what you see. If you stand in front of a mirror, and you don't like move anything, it is what you see there. It's and you'll people see. think of that as their vagina, but mm -hmm. your vagina is what you see if you like pull apart all the, you know, all the flaps of skin outside, which is your vulva, and you kind of look in and see the hole, that's your vagina. So a really easy right. way to remember, an easy way to remember that, and someone told me this and I thought it was kind of brilliant, is vagina has the word in in it. So vagina is inside and vulva is outside. So you can always kind of love that. that. Yeah, love I love that. it too. You can send hearts to say thanks to Jackie because now we all remember that. <laughs> yeah, um, I, yeah I, I think, so I just want to add to that definition is that a lot of the questions that came in said like right after I had a baby, it hurt. Um, you know, when I started getting sexually active, it hurt. Um, and more often than not, that tends to be vaginismus. And vaginismus is probably the most common. So I promise we will do another one. As a matter of fact, I think in two weeks, I have, uh, we have one of our patients, Savannah, do you remember did a film about vaginismus? Hysterical, amazing. Yeah. Oh, she, I'm gonna have her on talking about the film and vaginismus. So we're not forgetting so vaginismus, but we're moving on right now. And let's talk about 
Vulvodynia. Let's talk about vulvodynia. So, or vestibule dynia, whichever you want to say. Yeah. <laughs> so the vestibule, again, to take it to like bring it down again to another kind of fine point here. So the vestibule is a part of the vulva. It's a sort of a subdivision of the vulva. It is this transition zone in between the vulva, which, you know, so the labia, the things that are really on the outside, and the vagina. And it's this sort of you know, very hormonally sensitive tissue that a penis or a speculum or a tampon has to pass over right before the muscle. So it's that that soft tissue that, that overlays the um, the muscles that um, can cause spasms. So those two are very closely interrelated, and it is it does take a good line of questioning sometimes to have a clinician know the difference between pain in the vestibule and pain in the muscle. And a physical exam is really important to, to help distinguish. So one of the questions that somebody sent in is like, what kind of doctor do you go to? And this is one of those times where I feel like you really need a super specialist. Like Indeed. if you go to your gynecologist and they can help you, they'll give you some basic things and that could be so helpful. But if you feel like you're getting stuck and you're not getting answers, you really need to go to a pelvic pain specialist for women, like a, somebody who specializes in vulvar vaginal pain. So, right, and yeah. can take, you know, more, take more than 10 or 15 minutes with you to really get deeper into, you know, the root cause, um, because, you know, most GYNs are mostly concerned with things more upstream, you know, like the, the cervix, the uterus, and a, a sexual medicine specialist is a little more downstream. So I love that upstream. That's so funny. That is yeah. really, really funny. So yeah. you want to just spend a minute talking about what that exam looks like? Because I think that might be helpful for people. Yeah. So for instance, like when you come to Maze and, and you're, you know, you have sexual pain, you have pain with penetration, you can't put tampons in, or, you know, you've been on birth control and nothing used to hurt, but now all of a sudden everything hurts. So the obviously there's a lot of you know history that we take and, and we, we spend a significant amount of time doing that but then once we get into the exam room um someone who's a specialist in sexual medicine will first of all make you comfortable and let you know that everything we do is we're gonna let we're gonna talk to you we're gonna talk you through it you know really looking for feedback so we do what's called the q-tip test where we kind of gently press it into the different areas of the vestibule almost like a clock and we ask you to tell us how much pain you're having um, if you'll tolerate it, we then, you know, do more of an internal muscle exam um, to feel the muscles around. And we may take, you know, take pictures that can help you to see, you know, what things look like down there. Because it, it is very hard for women to, even if in their own homes, look down there and know what's going on. So walking through that exam with a patient, actually visualizing it is, is sometimes the first time that you know, it's that person's ever done that. And it's really helpful. Um, so they understand why they're having pain, too. And sometimes you'll see things that are red and sometimes you won't, but you still know that there's pain there. So, um, so the, I think what people don't always get is that it could be a few different causes. Like it's not always, like I think often women come in saying, oh, like tell me the thing that's wrong, but they don't realize it could be a composite of things. Yeah, I mean, so, there's like three or four kind of usual suspects um, when it comes to vulva, vulva vulvodynia, see, even I trip up on this, vulvodynia, vestibulodynia. Um, the most common one that people think of, most, you know, we probably see the most of, is the hormonally mediated vestibulodynia. Um, this is the woman who, you know, has been on birth control pills for more, you know, five, 10, sometimes not, not even like a couple of years. And all of a sudden, um, sex becomes painful. The tissues down there become itchy and red and raw. And they, I've heard women say that they can't, you know, sit down in their car without pain. And when you examine these women, you really open things up and you look and it is, like you said, it is red, it looks irritated. Um, and that is, that is a sign of hormonal changes in that vestibule, which again is very rich in estrogen and testosterone receptors and birth control pills really take away your own endogenous hormones. And those tissues are sometimes extremely sensitive to that. And that in combination with the history, the full, you know, the history we took leads us to the answer. I mean, it's so aggravating to us so many times. I mean, I can't tell you how many women come in and they say, you know, I've been on birth control for a bunch of years and I asked my doctor if it could have anything to do with it. And the doctor says no, because it wasn't a problem last year. And the first thing we do when there's hormonally mediated um, vestibulodynia is change birth controls, like either take them off the right, because yeah, we, yeah. Or I mean, we, yeah. we treat topically, you know, because we can do that regardless. But usually we have to have that conversation, which is 
sometimes tougher women because they're, some women are really attached to their birth control. You know, they like how it's made their periods regular. They, you know, feel better on it. You know, whatever their, the reason their is. Their skin is really good on their it. Their skin looks good. They're worried they'll gain weight if they, I mean, like all the things. We've heard them all, right? So, and, but then and they should realize that one of the reasons their skin is good is because when the, when the birth control cuts down and stops you from producing certain hormones like testosterone, it clears up your skin. So, yeah. you know, you got a trade off there. So you got a trade off. I yeah, mean, that birth exactly. control pill I could go on and on is really just masking your symptoms. It's not giving you a, a period. It's not regulating your periods. It's just covering it all up and overriding the system. So in doing so, there are consequences, which unfortunately, most gynecologists don't um, either know about or take the time to really discuss or, you know, there's political reasons for this. There's other, you know, our research implicate, you know, there's, this just hasn't been mainstream, but we as clinicians see it often. And you, almost always when, when they're off their birth control pills, we, um, we see, you know, rapid changes, especially in the younger girls. So what, so, so I know we do, we, we take people off birth control pills. We treat topically, use, topical estrogen, right? Mm -hmm. like, topical hormones, which again, like are just topical, nothing by mouth. It's really just local treatment, meaning we put the treatment right where the, where the problem is. And now we have a laser that, and we have a laser. So the laser is really for, um, for women who are, um, post menopause. So that is for women. So those are cheap. That's the other piece or of peri hormonal laser. Peri or well, yeah, yeah, perimenopause, anyone who's really got low levels of estrogen, um, typically, the woman who's, you know, they're late perimenopause or menopause. Um, and those women with really low levels of estrogen can get similar symptoms to this, the women we were just speaking of who've been on birth control, right? So if you're that woman, um, a Mona Lisa laser, so it's a CO2 fractionated laser that works obviously without hormones um, to target the tissues and have your body kind of you know, works to regenerate collagen and elastin and grow healthier, stretchier, more lubricated tissues that replace kind of the old dried up, you know, at, you know, it's a word called atrophy, which means thinning um, and drying up of the tissue, which happens in menopause. So that's another option, which is popular. We've never used that. Have we ever used a laser on like a woman after pregnancy or something? We just don't. Like, is that just, it's not approved? I don't know. Well, it's not really approved for GSM, for, you know, menopause either, um, technically. But it's just because it's... Um, you know, a woman after pregnancy is going to have her hormones come back at some point. So this is more of a sort of permanent treatment in the sense that, you know, you do you do maintenance, but it has more long lasting effects. Well, it is really cool. And if you're if you're watching this and you're younger, which you, tends to be the case with Instagram, we should really go on Facebook to talk about the Mona Lisa. That's true. But you, your mom or, you know, some other woman in your life, may, it is really very cool because there's Any no woman medication. Can have it. You could be 75 and, and have a Mona Lisa laser if you're having pain and discomfort. So it, it really, and it's for women who've had breast cancer, who can't take hormones. It's a really great option. Okay, so we got, so th that's what happens if it's hormonally mediated, right? If, if, if the problem is the hormones. But there, there are other reasons why somebody could have vaginal pain. Yes, there um, are, are, are many, and I'll try to be brief because there's like, there's a lot of subsets. But the second kind that, you know, we, we do see is called neuroproliferative. Again, another mouthful of a word. So neuro is like neuro, so basically neurologic pain, right? The vulva and the vestibule are rich not only in, hormone receptors, but also in nerve endings. Um, and it's something, you know, such as a vaginal infection, like, a, like chronic yeast infections or um, an allergic reaction can set off this inflammatory reaction that causes nerve pain that unfortunately is very difficult to treat sometimes. Not to say it can't be treated, but nerve pain is, is, is challenging throughout the body and, and the vestibule and the, the vulva are really no different in that way. Um, this is a woman who's going to have pain throughout her entire vestibule. You may look at it and it looks fine. I mean, half the time you, you never know when a gynecologist you know, to, usually we'll say, I don't, you know, they'll kind of shrug and say, you look fine, go on your way. You know, I, have can a tell, I can't tell you how many messages I get from women who say, you know, I know I'm having pain and I go to my gynecologist and she says, everything's fine. And, and I don't, I, I always sort of, I'm like half laughing or not, because like, if it's hurting you, everything is not fine. And just because they can't see something doesn't mean everything is fine. It just means they can't see something. So, right. you know, I always feel like healthcare practitioners should be careful to say, like, I'm not seeing what the problem is, do you know what I mean? As opposed yeah. to, you're, you're fine. fine, Right. see a therapist and get a glass of wine. Right. Pain is what the patient says that it is, not what you see or, you know, take in with your own eyes. As, exactly. As exactly. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and again, taking a really good history is important. If that patient tells you, you know, I've, 
I had, you know, I was treated for a lot of yeast infections, you know, a few years ago. And then this kind of this pain just started and I keep getting, you know, and people just get treated for these presumptive yeast infections or these UTIs. And it kind of shows up in these other ways. And really what's going on is that there's this nerve pain. Um, you know, treatments for this kind of, you know, it's, it can be a mixed bag of things. It can be, we try topicals, you know, we try pain medications like Neurontin, either by mouth or topically. Um, we try sometimes even estrogen to calm the nerves there a little bit. We can try, um, you know, some old fashioned um, antidepressants can actually have some impact like, um, like amitriptyline. Right. I want to be clear here. Those antidepressants are helping because they calm down the nerve system, nerve not pain. because no. we think you're crazy. Not <laughs> at all. These are these off label uses that we are, we have tried and found some kind of anecdotal success in using. Again, there's no real playbook for this kind of thing. So we have some things that we think, you know, may help and really wouldn't hurt. And so we try them. Um, you know, we apply topical capsaicin, which is like a red pepper extract, you know, that can kind of help the nerves, you know, calm down. Um, we at our practice have a low level laser, which is actually a pretty painless laser to use. Um, that can kind of uses, you know, a, a bunch of different waves to kind of calm the nerve endings. Um, it's used in other parts of the body as well in other disciplines. Um, but there are women who find benefit from that. Um, and for the women who really, you know, nothing works, it, ultimately, you know, we do refer them for surgery where we get, they can have a piece of that vestibule kind of surgically removed. Um, and that does, you know, usually help. But right. that's a so, procedure, obviously. You know, these patients are often, I always feel terrible because, you know, they've been struggling for so long. They've gone from doctor to doctor. They don't get answers. And so one of the things I often will tell women in this situation is like the good news and the bad news. So the bad news is if you, if nothing else is working, you know, if you have this overactive nerve endings and nothing else is working and really you've tried everything, the surgery is miserable. It is a miserable surgery. I don't lie. Like it is, you're on your back, I think for two weeks, like you, you often, you can't really go very far for another two to four weeks. It's painful. It's really mm -hmm. an unpleasant surgery. But yeah. the good news is like it works in 98% of the cases. So yeah. if you know that somebody can say to you like, we can fix this, it's just going to be a month of kind of misery and then another month of like not so good. Um, you know, that is not so terrible. I mean, I, it is terrible, but it's less terrible than having yeah. something that cannot be addressed. So right, or trading chronic pain for acute pain in the short term might be something that people can get on board with, you know, exactly. But one of the things we definitely find is that if we try enough different things, we can sometimes alleviate the pain. And that sometimes is the way you should be approaching this with your healthcare provider. Like, let's try a bunch of things and see if we can get the pain down from an eight to a three, and I can live with the three. Yeah. Um, or if there's times of the month that it's worse, or, you know, maybe we can start identifying it so you can manage it during those times of the month. You're right. It takes a really close relationship with the practitioner who's patient and kind and listens and is willing to try things alongside of you, you know, and I think that's what you get in a sexual medicine practice. Um, because it's, this is not an easy road to go down, but, um, you know, we do it and, and, you know, sometimes patients get better and sometimes they need surgery and, and you never know who's going to be who. So we try it every time. You know, and then that also gets into why we encourage therapy. So we do therapy while, and also if you're, you know, if you're not near us, you're in Florida or something and you're getting help, I would say, make sure you're also seeing a therapist, not because you're nuts. And not because there's anything wrong with you and that's what's causing the pain, but because living with this level of pain and, and having so for so often heard that you're nuts or that you didn't try hard enough or you're eating too much yeast or you're eating, you know, too many eggs or whatever, like that's, that's very soul crushing. And yeah. having somebody to talk to about all this can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. So I really yeah. do, if you're one of those women, I really do encourage you to do that. Um, but I, but that does kind of take us full circle because sometimes, sometimes vulvodynia is a reaction to vaginismus, right? To tight muscles. Yeah. So can so you talk about that for a minute? That's, yeah, that's definitely another chicken and the egg thing, like which came first. But a lot of times in women who've had a persistent vaginismus that they've lived with for many years and they never knew what it was and, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, they don't even know what's going on or they have avoided that area of their body for so long because of fear and anxiety and and pain that literally those tissues have never, they've never been touched, they've never been separated, they've never seen the light of day. And that can cause, you know, what we call again, atrophy or thinning or dryness or irritation or, or inflammation in that area. And so sometimes in women with vaginismus, we can look and see that they have almost like it looks like a hormonally mediated, but it's really just 
secondary to that tight muscle that's right behind that opening. Sometimes well, I'll explain to women because they'll, they'll be like, how could it be tight muscles? It feels like burning. And, and I'll say like, if you take your fist and you squeeze your fist as hard as you can and like you hold it, and you hold it because you have so much, you hold it, and you hold it. So you feel it. And if you kept doing that for 10 minutes, you'd start to, this would get really sensitive right around here. It would be really mm -hmm. hot. Can you imagine you've been doing that for 20 years? Like you've been doing that for 20 years, that right. skin around there. So learning how to kind of relax those muscles and be able, just, it makes everything, mu the muscles become soft and pliable and it does you don't have that burning. Right. Through. When you're squeezing your muscles like that, you're really restricting blood flow to the area. I mean, again, this is not a voluntary thing. You don't, people don't even know that they're doing this with vaginismus, but you're really tight down there. Things, blood flow can't come and go. And those tissues need blood flow to get their hormones, to get their nutrients, to be healthy. So it does look a little menopausal sometimes. And the good news is that that's pretty easy to treat. I mean, we can use hormones there and that, you know, sometimes makes it that much easier to treat the vaginismus and do dilation. So really adding that in sometimes is, is a nice, you know, way to, to get to get these people better faster. One of the, the points I often make with patients and that goes, and goes full circle to where I started is that often your pain could be a co combination of these things, right? Like you have tight muscles and you have hormonal problems because of birth control pills. So you went to a doctor and they identified the hormonal piece and they fixed that, but they didn't yeah. fix the tight muscles. Right. Or you came in and the doctor identified that you went to a physical therapist and they identified the physical, you know, the tight muscles, but not the hormones. And then you get frustrated because you feel like you're not getting help, but you yeah. are, you're just getting a piece of the help. So right. finding somebody who puts all of those puzzle pieces together can be extraordinarily helpful. Right. I mean, and there's also some skin conditions, too, that can cause pain um, that typically are associated with menopause, like lichen sclerosis or lichen planus or erosive lichen planus that, you know, look and feel a little bit different. And again, are associated with tight muscles and, and tissue discomfort. Um, and, you know, giving a treatment plan that, that targets each individual aspect of the pain is really, really important. You can't just address, you know, one and up, not all of these issues. So what is the difference between, first of all, somebody asked me, and this I couldn't answer actually, which is like, oh my God. Uh, somebody said, is vulvodynia the same as vulvar vaginitis? As, now, vulvodynia is the same as vulvar vestibular, I'm sorry, vestibulodynia. Why don't you define the terms? Sure, I get it. Yeah, so, so vulva, the vulva, again, in, includes the vestibule. So vulvar, vulvodynia, Vul vestibulodynia, vulvo vestibulodynia, those are all technically sort of the same things. One's just a more specific area of the vulva. Meaning right. So again, vulvodynia is, mm -hmm. part, is, is Include, the overarching. Yes. And vestibulodynia is the vestibule in the vulva and yes. that particular hurts, right? Yes. And vulva vestibulodynia or vulvodynia mm -hmm. are the same thing, right? Yes. Oh, exactly. I'm sorry. Vestibulodynia and vest. And vulvodynia are the same things. Right. Vul vulvodynia encompasses vestibulodynia. Right, you can exactly. have vestibulodynia and not and have the rest of your vulva be okay. Right. But what the where I was getting trumped what I was getting tongue tied is vulva vulva vestibulodynia is the same as vestibulodynia. vestibulodynia. Exactly. Yes, yes. And that's what throws everybody off. Right, exactly. Well, I think what you said, too, is there was a different term when you were initially asked this question. You said vulva, vulva vaginitis, vaginitis or vulva vestibulitis. So, again, that ending that, you know, medical terms are, are derived from like Latin and, and every, you know, you can really break down these words. They seem overwhelming, but when you look at them. So a word that ends in itis just means inflammation, right? So you know, pancreatitis or appendicitis, that's just, you know, inflammation of an organ. So vaginitis is inflammation that can be because you have an infection or it can be like, you know, in the absence of an infection due to an out, you know, something allergic reaction or irritant or, you know, an environmental issue or, or trauma or something else that's not an infection. So it really is not specific to, you know, to anything other than just saying that things are inflamed, which is different that's than you can get, you can have inflammation and not have pain technically. Right. Yes. Okay. That makes total sense. I just, I had never heard of vulvar vaginitis. So that was super helpful. Okay. So, um, so now let's just spend one minute talking about, well, somebody asked about whether the, you need the Botox more than once for vulvodynia. And I want to straighten out that the Botox injections are for vaginismus. They're for tight muscles, right? Yeah. They, now, don't help, they don't help vulvodynia other than maybe in the long run they will. 
Um, or if, you if your vulvodynia is because of your vaginismus. Sometimes Correct. your tight muscles are a piece of it and then the Botox would help. But typically that would not be a starting place. I mean, Definitely unless not. you came in and Jackie <laughs> took a look at you and she said, listen, you have vulvodynia and a big piece of this is the tight muscles, although there are other pieces, then you might start with the Botox or some other dilation to, to make those muscles softer. But right. theoretically, that wouldn't be your first stop. No, no. Botox is very specific for the vaginismus procedure. Oftentimes, like as we were just describing, it's really important to also treat hormo the hormonal component of this, which some women, again, have both issues going on. So you can treat their their vaginismus might get better because you gave them Botox, but if you don't address the fact that they're still on oral contraceptives or that they have other reasons why their hormones are off, why they're having vestibulodynia or vulvar vestibulodynia, they're still going to have painful intercourse or pain, you know, because the, that's still an issue. So you didn't solve, you didn't really help them the way you, you should have. You know, if you, if you leave this live with one message, it's that most things do not, most vulvar pain is not based on one problem. It's a combination of problems and you really need somebody to kind of guide you through, help you. You may have to get those, if you're not near a sexual health center, you may have to get those in different pieces. You might have to go to a pelvic floor physical therapist then an OBGYN or yes. you may have, but you need somebody who's kind of putting those pieces together for you. So if you get nothing else from tonight, take that with you. Does that, yeah. Um, That's really true. And now I just want to, I do want to, we only have a couple more minutes, but I want to talk about pregnancy because a bunch of women asked about pregnancy. Like, can this develop during the pregnancy? I had pain during my third trimester of pregnancy um, right after I gave birth. What, what, what do you have to say to those women? Yeah, I mean, pain, you know, during pregnancy is, you know, your hormones are changing. I mean, your, you know, your levels, your progesterone, your ester, they're, they're different than when you're cycling. So sustained levels of hormones, you know, can, can affect the, the tissues in different ways. Unfortunately, during pregnancy, there's really not much you can do about that. After pregnancy, your pain be, could be because you had a vaginal delivery and you tore. I mean, there's, you know, that that's a whole different bag of pain. Well, your muscles signed up. They, yeah, your muscles, you mean your muscles can, or they can be too loose. Often that times that's the case. And so there's this disconnect between the brain and the muscles. So that's where a pelvic floor physical therapist is really important to help you start to get those muscles back in shape again um, so that you don't I, develop I, problems. I the jump in here. We've seen a bunch of women who had um, C-sections mm -hmm. and still developed like va vaginismus or tight muscles after. And like part of me, it took me ages to like, why would that be? Like the baby didn't even come barreling through that vagina. But I think there's just during the birth, you just clench or during the pre-birth, you just clench so much or so much is happening down there that women end up with tight muscles, even if they had a C-section. So you're not nuts if that has happened to you. Well, just, yeah, I mean, the baby didn't come out, so the muscles never stretched. So you wouldn't get, you know, you there, it's still, you could have, if you had vaginismus beforehand, you could have it during or after it, you know, right. that area was sort of untouched. So, and then afterwards, you know, your, your, your levels plummet, your breastfeeding, your estrogen levels are low. Um, so again, you, you're mimicking sort of the hormonal profile of a woman in menopause. Um, and that's because your body's smart and it's saying, I just had a baby and I'm breastfeeding and I don't want to be pregnant. So let me quiet all of those hormones so I don't ovulate. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, we see that commonly in, you know, vaginal dryness and pain with intercourse in the first, you know, kind of fifth trimester, fourth trimester after our birth is, is, you know, we often give vaginal estrogen for that. Again, and there that could be true. That really can get treated as opposed yeah, to- Yeah, and it needs to be treated. I mean, a good gynecologist should, should know that that's, you know, that's totally standard protocol. Right. Um, and, and women should feel comfortable knowing that it's safe to use for their bodies and for their babies and that, and that time pain, you know, and, and getting back to a relationship and a sexual relationship with your partner, you know, is really important after you have a baby, everything changes. So- you know, it, taking that that kind of back for yourself is is a good thing to do for the whole family. So two other questions that came up that I think, um, one was, is it genetic? Somebody asked if it was genetic. And I thought that was a really interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Is, is vulvodynia genetic? Is that what you're at? I really don't think so. Again, I mean, it would, the only kind of vulvodynia that could potentially, I mean, yeah, there's the primary vulvodynia, which is, again, for no other cause, you were just born this way. Um, that's just more congenital, meaning that's just you were born this way. Um, the, we don't know a lot about which women um, are going to have a hormonally mediated vestibulodynia, meaning like there's, we don't, when we give a birth control pill to a woman, 
we have no idea whether she's going to be that percentage of women that reacts this way to the pills. There are women who, who just did, it's important to know, like there are women who are fine on birth control pills and this never happens and it's never an issue, but there is this subset. And I don't think there's any research around who those women are and whether that's a genetic, like, you know, component or whether that's just, you know, unfortunate kind of circumstance. And then somebody asked whether electrotherapy is for worse for this. And I have to say, I've never heard of that. I wondered if what they meant was, um, I wonder if they, what they meant was laser. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of shockwave therapy now that they're using on men. So mm -hmm. it's very similar to the laser, but there's no electrotherapy for the, at least as far as no, I know. Right. No I mean, shockwaves are sound waves, you know, that, that, you know, break things up and, and no, we don't, we have not yet. We've yet to use that in the, <laughs> in maybe the vulva, we, but we who can knows? try that. We're using it a lot on penises. You know, Hey, it might work. Maybe, maybe we just came solved the world's problems in this Instagram live. <laughs> oh my God. All right. I, so I think that pretty much summed up. Is there anything you didn't say that you feel like we should, you should say? No, I think we touched on all the aspects. I mean, again, this is very nuanced. Treating this is not easy. It takes, you know, you have a commitment on the part of the patient and the clinician to really explore these different kind of, you know, treatment possibilities and, and be, you know, have an open dialogue about what's working and what isn't. And, and the most important thing, though, is to trust yourself. Like, if you're having pain, you're not nuts. You're not crazy. There is going to explanation. And more important than figuring out why you're having pain is how to fix the pain. And you have a right to have the pain fixed. So I want to remind you that we have a forum. I should have said this earlier. We do have a pain forum. It, it's called the Vaginismus Forum. And most of the women on there are talking about tight muscles and vaginismus. But there are pockets of other people talking about other kinds of pain. And um, w I think women find it really supportive, really healthy. Jackie goes on a lot to comment mm -hmm. and answer questions. We're getting a lot of hearts here. Um, and that forum is, I think, a godsend for a lot of women. So yeah. I really recommend that, you know, people go on there. Yeah, I think for chronic pain, you know, the sense of community and feeling like you're not alone is, is sometimes just, the you know, a gateway to getting better. Yeah. So Jackie, thank you so much. Next week, I'll be online with Dr. Werner. Let's see how that goes. We're talking mm -hmm. about hormones, specifically testosterone for men and for women. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know if most of you guys watching have met Dr. Warner, but it should be fun. And, um, and, but Jackie, thank you so much. And uh, we're going to have you back sometime soon to talk about something else because you're awesome. We'd love to do that. Good night. Good night.